I'd like to welcome Greg Jostin. He is South Dakota State Forester, and he will be moderating our third panel today. Okay, there we go. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Maggie said, I'm Greg Jostin, State Forester for the South Dakota Department of Agriculture. I'll be moderating this panel and I'll introduce our panelists. Uh, uh, first, uh, uh, Mark Van Every is the uh, supervisor of the Black Hills National Forest. Mark, if you'd come on up and join us. And uh, Carissa Kruger is the West River Director of uh, uh, Nature Conservancy. And uh, Ben Woodkey is uh, Executive Director of the Black Hills Forest Resource Association. So uh, thank you, uh, lady and gentlemen, for joining us. Um, I'm going to give just a, a brief uh, talk about uh, um, forestry, kind of a forestry 101, what it is, what it's all about uh, in, uh, in South Dakota. And uh, uh, Try not to get carried away on too many tangents. Uh, I remember when uh, uh, Jody asked me to do this and, and, and kind of tell you what forestry was all about in 20 minutes. I thought, wow, 20 minutes to tell you all about forestry. That's going to be quite a challenge. So I'll try not to get off on too many tangents and, and uh, uh, keep on schedule so that uh, we can uh, all have a chance to talk. <laughs> I know we're on a kind of a tight schedule this morning. So uh, uh, with that. Um, what I thought I'd start with is just the definition of forestry. We, we actually have a, a dictionary of forestry terms, a whole dictionary all to ourselves. Uh, but basically, the uh, forestry is the profession that embraces the science, art, and practice of creating, managing, using, and conserving forests. The, some of the key words here I want to point out are, are it is science-based, but it's also an art. There's a lot of design work that goes into uh, developing prescriptions and uh, putting them into place on the ground. Um, but uh, everything that we do is science-based. There's a lot of research that's gone into it, and uh, uh, that's what we use to, to guide us. It's also uh, conservation of resources, and uh, probably one of the other keys there is human benefits. You know, that's the, the main reason why we manage a forest. Forestry is a relatively new profession in this country. It's only been around for about 120 years. And uh, uh, it was basically brought over from Germany. Uh, Gifford Pinchot, who was the, uh, kind of considered the, to be the father of forestry, um, studied over in Germany. And he brought those principles back to the US to, uh, uh, to make forest management sustainable. And that's the other uh, key word there, um, for human benefits in a sustainable manner. Uh, sustainability is critical to forestry, especially here in the Black Hills, where if you ever looked at Google Earth or a satellite image of the Black Hills, you can see that uh, it's a very finite resource. And if we don't manage it sustainably, it's going to be gone. So uh, uh, forestry has uh, a biological uh, scientific basis, but also uh, quantitative, managerial, and social aspects to forestry. Um, but also uh, um, it has other specialized fields. Those specialized fields include agroforestry, which is important across South Dakota. It includes uh, uh, urban forestry industrial forestry, non-industrial forestry, and there's also uh, uh, disciplines in wilderness and uh, uh, recreational forestry. And it might be kind of surprising about the wilderness aspect of it because uh, you know, wilderness areas generally aren't managed, but it really becomes more of people management in, in those types of areas. Trees are really the defining characteristic of the forest. Uh, without trees, you don't have a forest. So uh, when we're talking about managing a forest, we really need to start by talking about managing the trees within the forest. And we have a term for that. Uh, it's called silviculture. 
Uh, silviculture is basically, the, uh, as it says, the art and science of controlling establishment, growth, composition, health, and quality of the forests. So it's something that, that begins from the seedling stage and all the way to maturity of the trees and uh, potentially harvest. And, you know, we're talking about a different type of a rotation uh, than you talk about in traditional agriculture. You know, uh, in, in agriculture, uh, in most disciplines of agriculture, you have to have that, uh, that annual income, uh, either from crop production, from selling cattle, things like that. Uh, with trees, you're looking at, well, like here in the Black Hills, from the time uh, you have a seedling, to a mature tree is about 100 years. So that's over three generations. Uh, that's not something that can provide you necessarily with uh, an income on an annual basis. Uh, so there has to be other things, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. But uh, um, so we have to think in the long term when we talk about forest management. We're talking about the life of the forest. Different parts of the country, that life is a lot shorter. Down in the southeast, you know, they have, uh, they can grow trees to saw timber size in 35 years. We can't do that here in the Black Hills because of site quality, precipitation, things like that. But a couple of other things that are in this definition, uh, again, uh, needs of and, and values of landowners and society, so people are involved in that, again, and sustainability. Uh, sustainability is critical in forest management. For managing those trees, uh, we have what we call uh, silvicultural systems. Silvicultural systems are, can be looked at in a couple of different ways. Uh, the trees are, uh, um, or a tree stand is uh, looked at uh, based on age classes of the trees. You know, whether or not they're all the same age, if it's uh, a couple of different ages, or if you have multiple ages within the stand. But also, when we, when we start to, uh, uh, to remove trees, uh, we have different approaches. Uh, the one that is probably the most popular here in the Black Hills is called the shelterwood system, where you have a partial cut, and then uh, um, you remove some more trees later on. And, but you always leave enough trees there to regenerate the stand. We depend pretty much on natural regeneration here in the Black Hills. Ponderosa pine is very prolific, and given the opportunity, given the seed source, we get lots and lots of baby trees out there. And uh, uh, the, uh, the next one on here is the seed tree cut, and that's where we remove most of the trees on the site, but leave just enough to provide a seed source for the, uh, 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 to regenerate the stand. Coppice is a term that mainly applies to hardwoods. Um, when we want trees to re-sprout, uh, rather than reseed themselves, we use uh, a coppice cut, which is basically removing all the above ground trees. And uh, that allows the, uh, the trees to re-sprout. And this is important in, in aspen, because mature aspen trees release a chemical which suppresses sprouts and doesn't allow them to, uh, to grow. Um, by removing those, those top trees, especially as they get old and decadent, get diseased, and, and aspen uh, really doesn't live very long in terms of the life of, of trees. They die out after about 80 years. Uh, so they need some kind of a disturbance to come through and regenerate them. If, uh, um, if that happens, either through cutting or fire or something else, then the, the trees will re-sprout and reoccupy the site. Um, a couple of others up here, selection is where you remove uh, individual trees. Uh, this is important for trees that need shade in order to regenerate. Um, selection by removing trees leaves a lot of shade out there and trees that require shade then have an opportunity to reseed in those places and naturally regenerate. Group selection is similar but it just takes out uh, a small clump of trees. And then there's clear cutting, uh, which is kind of the, uh, um, the least socially acceptable forestry practice. And it's the one usually waived by people who oppose forest management as being what uh, is the most popular thing to do. Uh, we really don't have very much clear cutting here in the Black Hills at all. In fact, any, any clear cutting that's done is on a very limited scale in very small areas. Uh, because we need to, we want to keep that seed source there. Usually when clear cutting is done, 
The idea is to, uh, to replant the site, possibly to a different species, or um, in, in production forestry, like in the southeast, they'll remove all the mature trees and, uh, and completely replant the site uh, to start a new rotation. But uh, even though society doesn't like clear cutting, it's really one of nature's preferred methods of uh, uh, re stand replacement. And just about any place you drive in the Black Hills, you can see evidence of that. Um, we've had a lot of big fires in the Black Hills over the last uh, 30 years. And uh, a lot of those fires have been stand replacing fires. Now, the difference between nature's uh, clear cutting and uh, clear cutting that people do is people keep regeneration. They want to regenerate that, uh, that area after they remove the trees. So they want to go out and replant or get uh, uh, seedlings established somehow. Uh, with nature, you can go a very, very long time without having any trees come back to that site. Uh, this is a picture of the Battle Creek fire. You can see this along Highway 16. And uh, this fire occurred back in 2002. And you can see, excuse me, oops, wrong button. You can see that uh, there's just a few trees coming up uh, along the base where there's, there's still an established seed source. But they're coming in very slowly. It's probably going to be another 20 years, 30 years before that hillside is reforested. And uh, it could be another um, 80 to 100 years before any products can be taken off of that hillside, uh, which is probably about just in time for the next mountain, really big mountain pine beetle epidemic if things go as they have in the past. Okay, once we get the stand regenerated, uh, we've got lots of, lots of baby trees out there. Ponderosa pine in the Black Hills is very prolific. It'll regenerate uh, more than 5,000 seedlings per acre. In fact, uh, whereas most parts of the country have a problem regenerating their stands, in South Dakota we have a problem with too much regeneration. And consequently that becomes an expense to uh, establishing a healthy stand of trees. So if we have too many trees out there and we don't do anything about that, this is kind of what we end up with, is just this mass of what we call dog hair thicket of trees. And you can see there, oops, keep hitting the wrong button. You can see there that these trees are not in a healthy condition. They're competing for what little bit of light, water, and nutrients are available out there. And uh, you're getting some growth on a lot of different trees, but not very much growth on any trees at all. And uh, consequently, something has to happen here in order to get rid of some of those trees. And you can see also there's uh, nothing growing in the understory. There's no, there's no grass down there, no, no understory vegetation at all. So what we do is we thin the trees. And that's at the expense of the landowner. Uh, it's an expensive process. There's no product that comes off of that, no, no commercial product that comes off of that. But it's necessary in order to release the larger trees and uh, give them an opportunity to put on that wood volume growth. Uh, because you can see here, uh, the unthinned stand is almost so thick you can barely walk through it. So here's the difference between uh, growth on a thinned and an unthinned stand. The, uh, the, pick, the uh, tree cookie, that's what we call the technical term for these things. The tree cookie on the left is a 78-year-old 5-inch diameter, or 78-year-old uh, tree. It's only 5 inches in diameter. The one on the right is 63 years old and uh, 16 inches in diameter. These uh, tree cookies were both cut in the Black Hills, but that's the difference between a very uh, high um, competition in a, in a tree stand and uh, a tree that's fairly open grown. And uh, this particular uh, tree cookie comes from a tree that didn't have much competition uh, throughout its life. Um, very good growth, but uh, so what, what happens is either you get a little tiny bit of growth on a lot of different trees, or you can get your growth concentrated on bigger trees. But uh, you know, it, the, each acre has a carrying capacity. You can only sustain so many trees or, or it only put out so much growth. You can either concentrate that growth 
on, in, on uh, certain individual trees, or you can let it be scattered out over a lot of trees. To accomplish thinning, uh, most of it is uh, done mechanically these days. We still have some people out there that use chainsaws to thin. Uh, the, uh, uh, and this is non-commercial thinning. Um, but the, uh, uh, the cost of, uh, especially workman's compensation costs, are, uh, are too high, and so we've gone to more mechanized uh, thinning. And it really does a good job. There's, uh, uh, it does a good job cleaning things up. The fuel gets scattered out. It's, it's mulched. And uh, uh, so there's very little uh, fuel uh, left to deal with. Uh, this particular machine is a uh, diamond head mulcher. Uh, there are also fecon mulchers. Uh, some landowners who own quite a bit of land and do quite a bit of thinning have bought their own fecons uh, to uh, uh, do the thinning on their property. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, commercial harvest is done mechanically. Uh, again, there's a few people out there that still uh, are cut with chainsaws, uh, basically in areas that are too steep or too rocky for machines to work. But uh, most of it's done mechanically. Uh, have a mechanical feller, uh, whole tree uh, skidding, and uh, the, uh, the logs are delimbed in a, in a log deck by a, a boom delimmer. And uh, what you end up with is uh, a pretty clean site out there, but you do have slash piles. We don't have any market for slash piles uh, at this time. Uh, you know, there are some markets out there like biochar, but um, they haven't developed enough yet so that uh, uh, we can take advantage of that. What happens to this is it gets burned. And fire is a part of our Black Hills ecosystem. You've all probably heard that if, uh, if fire hasn't burned through part of the Black Hills, it's not a question of uh, if it will burn, it's when it will burn. And uh, fire is used not only to dispose of these slash piles, but also on a broadcast basis to, uh, uh, to reduce fuel uh, levels in the forest and also to uh, um, sometimes to do thinning when the trees are very small. So fire can be both a, uh, uh, an asset or it can be very detrimental. But this is one of the disturbance mechanisms in the hills. And uh, this is the other big disturbance mechanism in the hills. This is mountain pine beetle. And as you know, we just got over a very large uh, mountain pine beetle epidemic. Lasted from 1996 to uh, 2016 and affected more than 450,000 acres of the forest. Uh, this is an example of the type of clear cutting that uh, mountain pine beetle does. Uh, it alters entire landscapes. Uh, but it does it slowly over a, a period of years rather than hours like uh, uh, what can happen in fire. Uh, the newest insect that we have in South Dakota is an invasive species, emerald ash borer. Dr. O talked about this a little bit yesterday. It's been found over in Sioux Falls. Um, and uh, probably over the next 20 years, it'll spread throughout most of the state. Uh, ash trees uh, amount to or make up well, they're the, the second most abundant tree in South Dakota. And uh, planted extensively in our communities after Dutch elm disease took out our American elm trees. And uh, um, our ash trees have no resistance to this insect at all. And consequently, unless trees are treated with pesticides, uh, all of our trees, all of our ash trees are going to be lost to this insect. If you want to know more about this, you can go to our website, uh, emerald ash borer in South Dakota.gov, or tonight, Dr. Ball is giving a talk on emerald ash borer over at the uh, uh, Game Fishing Parks outdoor campus. Starts at 7 o'clock tonight, and uh, you can answer all your questions about this little green monster. Um, real quickly, agroforestry is practice in the state. Silvopasture is, um, is cattle production in forested areas, and uh, uh, that's very beneficial in South Dakota, especially in the Black Hills, because that's what gives our, our uh, ranchers an annual income. You know, the trees are a long-term income, but the uh, uh, being able to graze cattle in the Black Hills provides an annual income to... Uh, uh, to our, our ranchers here. 
Uh, other forms of agroforestry are windbreaks. Uh, we do have an extensive uh, amount of windbreaks in the state, uh, riparian forest buffers, which protect our stream courses, and uh, uh, alley cropping and forest farming are uh, also agroforestry practices, but they are not uh, practiced very much here in South Dakota. And last but not least uh, is we also practice community forestry uh, in South Dakota. The, uh, the benefits of trees and communities is uh, uh, we're learning that th those benefits are increasing uh, and uh, are very valuable. Um, they provide shade, of course, energy conservation to homes if they're planted in the right place uh, and the right species. Uh, they can provide some wildlife, uh, habitat, aesthetics. Um, they increase property values, uh, reduce stormwater runoff. I just heard that uh, you know, Minnesota, or the Twin Cities areas, has been dealing with uh, emerald ash borer. And in the areas where they've lost uh, ash trees to emerald ash borer, they've had a 33% increase in stormwater runoff, which is uh, very significant and uh, can be a real problem for, for large cities. Um, health and behavior uh, studies have shown that people recover more quickly in areas with trees. Uh, from, they recover more quickly from illnesses and uh, um, behavior. Uh, studies have shown that there is less crime in areas with, uh, uh, with trees. So uh, with that, uh, I'm out of time. So uh, we'll have some time for questions uh, when we finish up. But I'm going to turn this over to Mark Van Every, who's going to talk a little bit about the Black Hills National Forest. All right, thanks, Greg. Um, very good introduction, and I'm gonna try to build on that, but be a little more specific just to the Black Hills. So best place to start is the beginning. Um, the Black Hills National Forest was uh, established in 1897 as a forest reserve by President Cleveland. Um, and then a year later, um, or a, 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 excuse me, 10 years later, the Black Hills Forest Reserve was transferred to the US Forest Service and redesignated as the Black Hills National Forest. That was the time that Gifford Pinchot, that Greg mentioned, uh, became the first chief of the Forest Service. Uh, another year later, the Bear Lodge National Forest over in Wyoming was added. And then uh, in 1915, the Sundance National Forest, also in Wyoming, was added. And finally, in 1954, uh, the Harney National Forest down around the Custer area was added to give us our present day Black Hills National Forest which encompasses a perimeter of about 1.5 million acres uh, around the Black Hills. And within that 1.5 million acres, about 1.2 million is actually national forest. There's a number of private inholdings and other things scattered throughout the, the perimeter. There's four districts. One is located in Sundance, Wyoming. That's the Bear Lodge Ranger District. Uh, it is, um, see if I can get the right button here. It's up here um, in this area. And then we have our Northern Hills District based out of the Spearfish area, um, the Mystic District based out of Rapid City here, and then the uh, Hell Canyon Ranger District, which has offices in Custer and over in Newcastle, Wyoming as well. Um, so those four areas, uh, we have District Ranger in each location. Um, some interesting facts about the forest. Um, the Black Hills, I think, as most folks know, is derived from a, a Lakota word, Paha Sapa, which means hills that are black. And obviously, if you look at it from the air, as Greg mentioned, or as you're driving across from the east, uh, you can clearly see that uh, change in coloration. Um, it's also the site of the first ever timber sale in the US Forest Service. And that timber sale was laid out by Gifford Pinchot. Uh, it was in response to some overcutting that was occurring as a result of mining activity, in particular, the Homestake Mine. Um, and so it was designed to be sustainable, to be able to continue to supply uh, timbers to that mining operation in a way that wasn't going to be uh, using it faster than it could regrow. And that area, I, I'll mention, we continue to manage that and, and we're probably on our fourth or fifth um, rotation of cutting trees in that area. Uh, so it's been managed very well over the years. It's over in the Nemo area um, and it's a place that uh, we continue to watch because it's a good case study of what can happen with, with professional management of an area. Um, also, we're the, the site of Black Elk Peak, the highest point in South Dakota, and it's also deemed the highest point between the Rocky Mountains and the Pyrenees over in Italy. So uh, we're kind of, a, a, an, again, an island 
in more ways than one. Um, we have two national scenic byways uh, that are in whole or in part on the National Forest. One is the Peter Norbeck Scenic Byway, uh, which travels through a portion of uh, the forest as well as Custer State Park. Um, and then we have the Spearfish Canyon Scenic Byway um, out of Spearfish and, and uh, in that area. Um, and then we have a relatively small but important wilderness area, the Black Elk Wilderness. Uh, it's the location where Black Elk Peak is. Um, and it's a very popular area. We get to, the, over the course of the summer, we'll have 30 to 35,000 people that will hike the trail up to the top of uh, Black Elk Peak. So very, very uh, popular area. But as Greg mentioned, it's also an area that we don't do a lot of active management in terms of vegetation. And so it gives us an opportunity to observe natural processes at work and compare that to how those areas respond versus areas where we are able to manage. Um, and, and it gives us a good comparison. If you walk up there now, you're going to see some significant effects in areas from the mountain pine beetle because we were not able to go in and do harvesting or other activities. Um, and we're having some challenges keeping trails open because every time we get a windstorm, a few more of those trees come down across the trail. So economic impacts, I think I went a little too fast here. Economic impacts to the state of South Dakota. A variety of activities, and Greg mentioned many of them. Um, first of all, just total contribution to the gross domestic product, about $141 million a year. So a significant uh, economic contributor to the economy. Um, we also contribute about 387 million cubic, water, cubic meters of water annually. So for those of you who are in agriculture that are downstream of the forest, uh, we're an important contributor to the water that you need for your operations. Um, timber harvests uh, support about $58.5 million in labor on an annual basis and about uh, $69.2 million in gross domestic product contribution. So again, very important part of the economy, both at a state level as well as at a regional level. Um, grazing supports approximately $14 million, and I'll get into a little bit more details about that program, but uh, obviously important um, source of livelihood for a number of people in this area. Uh, as well as a, a source of production for, for meat for, our, uh, for the public. And uh, spending by visitors. The tourism economy here is very important uh, in this area, and it supports about $13.5 million in gross domestic product. So let's talk a little bit about forest management. And Greg did a good job of kind of giving an overview of silviculture. Um, the forest is dominated by ponderosa pine, uh, but also includes dense stands of spruce, areas of aspen, birch, and some oak. And typically, you find those uh, other tree species in riparian areas, or you'll find them on slopes that are north facing or down in a, a deeper canyon where there's a little more moisture, a little more shade. Um, forest management, this is kind of an example of what happened from the mountain pine beetle epidemic. Greg mentioned um, about 450,000 acres were impacted. Not all of those to the same degree. This is some of the more heavy types of impact that we had. Uh, but by going in and managing those stands, trying to get out in front of the mountain pine beetle, we were able to protect some trees that didn't get killed by the mountain pine beetle. And we were also able to take advantage of uh, that resource and be able to produce wood products out of it. Um, and the mountain pine beetle epidemic is largely over. Um, there's still a few areas where we have some concentrations down on the southern end of the forest. But the good news is we've gone back to to more natural or background levels. It's always there. It's not an invasive species, but it's one that is opportunistic. And when you have the right conditions, as Greg mentioned, you have dense, older trees, you give the, the beetles a very large food source. And their population will respond quickly. Uh, it will grow rapidly. But they've essentially eaten themselves out of house and home. And that's why the population is, has gone down dramatically. Um, a couple of the things that we, we use to manage, uh, Greg mentioned, uh, commercial timber harvest or timber sales, they provide the most cost-effective means for us to thin our stands. As, as Greg mentioned, when we use uh, do work in smaller diameter trees, um, things get a, a little bit more expensive. Um, and uh, in the case of the National Forest, we pay anywhere from $300 to $400 an acre to thin a, a stand of trees. So um, with about 40,000 acres that we need to thin a year, uh, you can imagine our budget probably isn't large enough to do everything we need to do, but we're trying to focus on the most important areas. 
Um, timber harvest in recent years, we sold approximately 180,000 cubic feet of saw timber annually. Uh, that's a, important in a number of ways. Number one, it allows us to do the management work we need to do on the national forest and to get the, the type of outcome we want after that work is done. But number two, as Greg mentioned, there's also a human component, social and economic, and that's a very important uh, raw, raw material for the timber industry in this area and provides jobs and income uh, for people in several of our communities. Um, secondly, again, we talked about pre-commercial treatment. Um, we try to treat about eight to 15,000 acres a year non-commercially. Most of that is mechanically, uh, but we do do some limited prescribed burning as well where we try to go in under the right conditions and run a fire through a young stand of trees to kill some of the trees, but not all of them. Um, recreation is also very important. Um, we have over 3,100 miles of roads and over 650 miles of trails that are open to motorized forms of recreation. And if you're uh, around anywhere in the Black Hills at this time of year, you're going to see lots of people coming in with big trailers, with UTVs, ATVs, and of course people just with, with uh, four-wheel drive or SUVs out driving around on our roads and enjoying, enjoying the area. Um, we also have 350 miles of non-motorized trails for hiking, biking, equestrian type use. And uh, again, very popular, uh, very large recreation events that happen throughout the year for mountain bike races, running races, that type of thing. Um, and it's something that's really growing uh, in this area and, and it's a, an, another economic engine for us. Um, and then we have over, we have 11 reservoirs, um, 30 campgrounds scattered throughout the Black Hills and about 26 picnic areas. And, those are very popular this time of year as well, and, and lots of folks moving around and using those areas. Um, some other types of recreation I mentioned are two scenic byways, Spearfish Canyon and Peter Norbeck. Um, we also have 1,300 miles of streams. So those of you who like to fish, there's some great opportunities out in the Black Hills. Um, and then uh, 13,426 acres of wilderness, the Black Elk Wilderness. Um, and 350 miles of groomed snowmobile trails. Uh, come back in the wintertime and enjoy the area. Um, people come from all over the United States uh, to use our snowmobile trails. They're very accessible, uh, well-groomed. We do that in partnership with the state of South Dakota Game Fish and Parks. And it's something that uh, has been a very popular use of the Black Hills in the wintertime. And uh, a little newer form of recreation is what's called fat tire bikes. Um, they go out and groom trails, just a fairly narrow corridor uh, that people will ride these bikes with the big tires on them and it's becoming very popular. Uh, we've designated 50 miles that we actually groom with volunteer groups. Uh, it's become a real popular wintertime activity in addition to snowmobiling. Um, so fire, as Greg mentioned, fire is a critical part of the ecosystem here in this area. It always has been. Um, and eventually fire is going to affect uh, as Greg said, most acres in, in the National Forest. Um, what we try to do is manage um, the fuels so that we can protect people, property, and other resource values that are important to us. On an annual basis, we average about 109 wildfires a year. Most of those you never hear about because we get them put out where they're an acre or less in size. Um, this year, we're well below that average, and if you've been around this area, uh, we've gotten lots of rain. In fact, the month of June, we were 200% of our normal rainfall. And I think in, in July, we're not quite that high, but we're certainly getting more rain than normal uh, in July. So unlike many other places in the West, we've had a relatively quiet fire year, but last year was, was a different, different situation. Annually, we usually burn about 8,900 acres a year. Um, and of course, some years are going to be bigger than others and, and affect that average, but to, um, it's, it's a significant fire program. We've had a lot of folks involved, both from the Forest Service and other agencies that work together to manage those fires and protect homes and property. Um, the, the, probably the most important thing that we do from the standpoint of fires is to do things before the fire ever starts. Um, about 75% of our fires are caused by lightning. And the average time to contain a large fire, anything 300 acres or larger, is about five to seven days. Contrast that to some of the larger fires in other states, and we're generally able to get our fires out pretty quickly, even the large ones. Uh, one of the fires in Colorado started June 1st, and it's still burning. Um, so we're usually uh, able 
because of all the active management in the area, uh, the cooperative nature of all the agencies, we're able to get those fires out pretty quickly um, here in this area. Um, the largest recorded fire in the Black Hills, and, and I believe in the state of South Dakota, was uh, the Jasper Fire, which was in 2000. It was about 83,500 acres. Um, that's become extremely uh, important wildlife habitat area. And our elk population in the Black Hills, that's where they spend their winters. Um, so it's, it, while, while there's detrimental effects of the fire, there's also positive effects as well. Um, Hazardous fuels reduction, taking care of those fuels, keeping them uh, at a lower level is what allows us to keep our fires small and to be effective when we do have a wildfire start. Um, directly, we treat somewhere between 3,000 to 5,000 acres annually. That can be anything from prescribed fire, it can be pile burning, or it can be mechanical thinning, a mulching type machine um, like we talked about. Um, and then secondarily, we treat about 25 to 40,000 acres, and that's other management activities like our commercial timber harvest helps to reduce the, the overall fire risk. And the timber contractors are an important part of that. We also do work to keep our meadows open and not have encroachment of trees, so we continue to provide that diversity of habitat. Um, our range and botany program. We have 144 permitted ranchers that graze 24,000 head of cattle on 135 allotments. Almost every area in the Black Hills is open to livestock grazing. There's a few places uh, because of sensitive resources like sensitive plants or riparian areas that aren't open. Uh, but that's an important, again, source of income for our uh, agricultural community here in the area. Um, and we also treat about 5,000 acres of invasive species or weeds annually. Um, if you talk to some of our neighbors, there's still a number of acres we're not getting to. With 1.2 million acres, we can't get to all of them, but we try to prioritize and do as much as we can on an annual basis. Um, soil and water, uh, we trade approximately 350 acres a year of areas where we have challenges with the uh, watersheds and try to improve those acres and the water resources themselves. And then fish and wildlife, um, we work cooperatively with the state of South Dakota and the state of Wyoming. Uh, the state game agencies manage the animals themselves and we manage the habitat. Um, and so restoration of habitat is an important part of our management activities and we use all the tools to do that. We use our timber harvest program, we use grazing, we use um, other forms of, of management activities as well. Um, and everything from game species, songbirds, things like that, uh, threatened and endangered species, and we do approximately 7,000 acres annually of terrestrial habitat improvement and about uh, eight miles of stream restoration as well. Uh, some of the species I mentioned, game birds, uh, butterflies, uh, big game species like the bighorn sheep, and of course our elk habitat. Um, and that's a, a picture from that Jasper fire area where the elk are wintering uh, over the winter each year. So national forests mean lots of things to lots of people, um, and uh, all of us use them for a variety of different things, but by managing them for those multiple uses, we're able to provide a variety of benefits to society as a whole. I'm gonna stop there and uh, give an opportunity for the other speakers and be happy to answer some questions as we uh, finish up. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Carissa Bussey. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity to speak today and learn from you all. And I'm going to present a little bit uh, from the perspective of a nonprofit conservation group. I work for the Nature Conservancy. I'm based here in Rapid City. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the roles that nonprofits can play. Uh, maybe sometimes you wonder, what are we doing out here? Why are we out here? What are we up to? Um, I'm going to talk about what we can bring to the table, and one of the main things is that we can help bring together different partners and players from a broad background to tackle some of the biggest challenges we have across the landscape that no one group can do alone. So I'll talk about some of those challenges we see in the Black Hills and some of the tools and partnerships that we can use to address them. Uh, our mission statement for the organization is to conserve the land and water on which all life depends, and when I say all life, that's all life. People and nature are intertwined. And the health of nature depends on people as much as the health of our communities depends on nature. 
So uh, I'll talk next, and we've talked a little bit, a common theme about the benefits that we get from nature for our air and our water and our economy. And equally, nature needs our stewardship, our active management on the landscape. So what are some of those values? Um, my statistics are going to be looking at it from a national standpoint, but you've heard a little bit about it from just the Black Hills. Our drinking water. Over half of our nation's drinking water is stored and filtered through forests. So our communities need healthy forests. Well, we run out of drinking water, and imagine that. <laughs> We're not going to be in a good situation. Our economy. Our timber industry and the jobs that that supplies and supports, over a million jobs are supported across the nation through the forest product industry. Additionally, over $13.6 billion are generated annually through recreation. That's a lot of money. And also, we have about 4,000 species that are dependent just on forests across the nation for habitat. Bad news is that kind of canaries in the coal mine, our forests are not doing very well across the West. So about 27% of those species are at risk of extinction in the current trends that we're on right now. We believe that it's really critical that we work with nature. Um, I think we all know Mother Nature is a pretty powerful force. And she has some natural adaptations. Some of those in the Black Hills are fire and pine beetle. Both of these are things that the forest evolved with. Uh, if you're in the southern Black Hills, the historic fire interval, what a term that's used, was every 10 to 13 years, roughly. And in the northern hills, every 30 to 33 years. So the forest is meant to burn pretty frequently. And it, She's meant to do that to help clean out some of that understory, as was mentioned before. Uh, that can help reduce fuel loads over time and create less large catastrophic fires. What will also, a buzzword you might hear these days is resiliency. Uh, what does that mean? A resilient forest is able to rebound quickly after a natural disturbance. So a fire that goes through a forest like you might see here uh, that's naturally adapted and is resilient can bounce back after the fire pretty well. It might even benefit from the fire. But a forest that you saw earlier in the slides, such as a dogwood stand, that is not a resilient forest and that is not going to recover. It is not going to bounce back the way we'd like it to. Um, challenges as well that we've changed the way the forest works. So I think you guys have probably seen these photos before. This is a photo from the Custer expedition back in the 1800s. And it shows on the right side a much thinner forest. This is before a lot of fire suppression went into play. And so we had less dense stands of trees compared to what you see on the left side of the photo, a much thicker forest with a lot more fuel. And we'll see if I can do this. Um, an interesting part of this photo, too, is this snag that you'll see in both photos. That snag is from historic fire. And historic fires that would move through do a small burn, the tree would live, it would shoot sap up through it. Next fire comes along, it shoots sap up to protect it. Next fire comes along, it shoots sap up, and what it does is it really creates a really dense, dense tree. And when the tree eventually dies, it's a snag, it stays there. And so that snag was there for over 100 years in this photo. Again, a sign that fire went through this landscape quite a bit and frequently. Another challenge is that our fire season across the West is becoming more and more dramatic. We are having larger fires for longer periods of time. Uh, the historic fire window that we expected wildfires in across the West was about five months. But because of a drier, hotter climate, that's bumping out on the shoulders. So we're seeing fires start earlier and later. That average now is about seven months. But as we saw as well with the Legion Lake fire, I guess all bets are kind of out the window now. When we could have our third largest fire in December, that wasn't even thought of before. That wasn't a possibility. Today it is. And uh, I think this kind of squashed my word, but that says intermingled. <laughs> um, we have a unique challenge in the Black Hills as well. We have a seriously intermingled landscape. So we have a patchwork of public and private lands over a third of our forest is privately owned, and it's not all in one spot. It's shotgunned across the landscape. And that in itself isn't a problem. But when those lands are developed and houses start to go in, it becomes a challenge. This is what we call the wildland-urban interface. And as we see, 
And as we've talked about, the forest is going to burn. And when these lands become more and more developed and intermingled in the landscape, it really challenges us when we need to manage fire and manage the health of our communities and save lives even down the road. So that um, map I showed you earlier, again, sorry I didn't describe this, but green is forest service and white is private land on that map. Harder to see on this. One of the things that's um, maybe a good luck scenario was that when the Jasper fire hit, it hit in a good location regarding that intermingled lands. Uh, Jasper fire was in one of the least developed areas of the Black Hills. So our largest fire, 83,000 acres, we didn't lose any lives, we didn't lose any homes, we just lost a few outbuildings. That's really fortunate. But if that fire had hit just a few miles further to the east, more into that patchwork that you can see on the side, or closer to Custer, that would have been a very different story. Or imagine if that fire hit in Keystone and spread up to Rapid City. That would be a devastating story. So there's the depressing <laughs> part of my slideshow. Um, and this recaps all that depressing news. The challenges are that the historic fire regime basically is out of whack. We're far departed from what we used to have. And we have significant intermingled lands that are increasingly being developed, and more and more of our communities are being put into that patchwork. The effect is that we have more homes, more communities, and more lives that are at risk every year. That is creating an increasing risk for our economy, our tourism, our timber. We're having decreasing habitat, decreasing ability to manage as we need to, and increasing costs as we do so. Um, so, sorry, there's the bad news. What do we do? We cannot address these challenges individually as any one agency, as any one landowner, as any one group. They are far larger than any one of us can do alone. We need to be working together and we need to be acting proactively. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the ways and tools that we can address some of these. Uh, going back, sorry, these slides are kind of hard to see, but um, this is that patchwork again. So one of the things, one of the tools we have is land exchanges. Um, one of, what a land exchange is in brief is that public landowners and private landowners come together and effectively swap ownership and they help to create more contiguous, larger chunks of either public or private land. So on this slide, you can see Jewel Cave here, the town of Custer, and Jewel Cave and Custer. And a similar map. In 2000, the Nature Conservancy finalized an exchange with the Forest Service in which we took the larger lands that you see highlighted in yellow. We purchased lands from willing landowners who wanted to do an exchange. We uh, traded them into the Forest Service and created one larger chunk of Forest Service land that also helped to protect Jewel Cave resources. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, Jewel Cave only covers about 5% of the cave resource. The majority of the cave is actually under private land and public land intermixed. And as people are drilling wells or putting in septics, that's impacting the cave over time. So we consolidated land over the cave and in exchange, uh, the Forest Service traded and then disposed of the scattered parcels you see in green. And those parcels we sold back into private land ownership, which helped to create better development opportunities closer to areas that were already in development. Um, this is also a great tool because it keeps land on the tax rolls, it can help our communities to develop where appropriate. And I didn't cross out exchanges, I think this is just messing with my slides. <laughs> Uh, so I was told I could move briefly out of the Black Hills while presenting. So I'm going to take you guys out to uh, Kanata Basin quick to give another example of how land exchanges work because for me it was hard to wrap my mind around what exactly is this and how does it work. I'll talk about another exchange we did in Kanata Basin which is located just south of Badlands National Park's north unit. And uh, Kanata Basin is home to a lot of these little fellas. Prairie dogs, and I know that this is probably not your favorite species for this particular group. Um, prairie dogs are critical for a lot of other species, though, that depend on them for food or for habitat. So that includes swift fox, burrowing owl, and our most endangered mammal in North America, the black-footed ferret. We understand 
that it also creates challenges for ranchers. And so how do we find pragmatic ways of working together for conservation? Let's step back in time in Kanata Basin to the homesteading days. Uh, you guys are probably familiar with this, but in homesteading, folks were given 160 acres to make or break a living on. And in this landscape, it was pretty difficult. Most of them broke on that. And what that left was a really complex legacy of land ownership. So pink on this map is Badlands, green is Forest Service, and blue is private ownership. And you can see this incredible checkerboard of land ownership. In a checkerboard like this, somewhat similar to what you'll see in the Black Hills, you really have a hard time meeting the management needs of public or private landowners. Um, in this instance, with prairie dogs, in the Black Hills, fire. Fire and prairie dogs, they don't seem to understand these maps. They don't stay on one or the other land ownership. They tend to just move. And so what can we do? Well, how can we work together? And this might seem overwhelming. How do you start in this landscape? But through a dedicated effort, what happened over decades was conscious land exchanges that changed that landscape ownership and helped to create larger, more consolidated land ownership for both parties to better meet the needs of public and private landowners. Uh, so that most recent exchange was completed in 2015. This is a pretty widespread map, but um, here we have Kanata Basin with the parcels in red. Those lands were owned by the Nature Conservancy. We traded them to the Forest Service, uh, as well as one of our neighbors who worked with us and traded land in. And in exchange, the Forest Service traded to us the scattered parcels that you see in blue throughout Buffalo Gap National Grassland. These were parcels the Forest Service did not want to manage. They were isolated. But they were parcels that families who ranched in the area had wanted to acquire for generations. So we went out, we asked who would be interested in acquiring those lands, and we worked with those families. Something like this took seven years to accomplish, but it was definitely worth the work. Um, not only a partnership, again, between the Forest Service and the Nature Conservancy, but also those 13 families who came alongside of us and made it possible. So moral being, when we can pull together across diverse backgrounds, we can make some pretty large projects possible. Jumping back now, down in the prairie, come back to the Black Hills. Uh, what you see here is a photo of the Nature Conservancy's Whitney Preserve. It is located just south of Hot Springs. And I'll talk a little bit about the preserve. It is land that the Nature Conservancy owns and manages as a private landowner. We do pay taxes in South Dakota. And I want to talk about how we use that base as basically a living laboratory is one of the terms we like to use. Uh, some of the history. Prior to the Nature Conservancy, uh, back in the 70s, this was all one ranch, everything you see in this photo. And during the times of high interest rates for loans, the family that owned and operated was not able to continue on. They needed to sell, and when they sold, they happened to sell to a developer, was the person that they were able to sell to. That developer ended up breaking, oops, whoop, I'm getting ahead. <laughs> um, they ended up breaking up what you see on the right side of the photo, into small ranchettes and homes. And at the time that the Nature Conservancy came in, they had also built the road that you see on the left side of the photo and had broken that up into 20 and 40 ranchette, acre ranchettes that they had for sale. The Forest Service was concerned about this and asked the Nature Conservancy if we could play a role. In 1998, we purchased our first holding at Whitney Preserve. It is now about 4,300 acres in an effort to conserve the only warm water system that is undeveloped in the Black Hills. So a really important system. We didn't want to see that being broken up and turned into subdivisions. But we didn't want to be an island either. And kind of like we were talking before, larger groups working together are critical for landscape conservation. So we worked with our neighbors as well. And those who were interested um, put their lands in what we call conservation easements. So about 12,000 acres of conservation easement, also buffer Whitney Preserve. And together, we have a larger area of working lands that will remain intact for future generations. If you're not familiar with an easement, um, some of the basic background is that a landowner, it's a private landowner's tool to make sure that their land stays intact in working lands 
um, for cattle or timber management, but it prevents future subdevelopment, division, subdivision development, or cropping and tilling. Uh, that says conservation easements. <laughs> and uh, as I mentioned, it, it helps to keep these lands intact. It can also help with generational transfer or estate issues when handing on to the next generation. Or it can be a tool for a person to expand their operation. Because of agriculture, we are fortunate that many of these inholdings I showed you before are working lands. They're not developed at this time. And a lot of families want to keep them that way. I receive a call on average about once a month from a landowner who is interested in an easement, wants to keep their land that natural state, or wants to purchase land and use it for ranching or timber. They're looking for a conservation easement. But that's one a month. That's a lot of easements. And uh, our organization alone, uh, here in Western South Dakota, we have two organizations currently that hold conservation easements, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, and the Nature Conservancy. And our two organizations cannot fill this need. Um, there is a large need for more land trusts that are willing and able to hold easements long term in order to meet these needs for the next generation. And it doesn't just benefit that one rancher or that one family uh, kind of stepping back again. It benefits their neighbors by keeping that land intact and it benefits our broader community and the health of our Black Hills National Forest and forest as a whole. This is a really important tool. I love maps, so I had to throw this in, but basically, going back, that red outline that you see is Whitney Preserve. The green hash are those conservation easements, and the bold green is Forest Service. So similar to what we saw in the previous maps, working together through land ownership, we can tackle some of those issues, and I'm going to hurry up. We also have a bunkhouse that we can use for groups based on conservation. Uh, free of charge to help advance needs. But we can't go back to what we had 200 years ago either. We are never going to get back to what we had. However, we can use active management, active forest management, to try to restore some of that natural resilience. Uh, we manage Whitney Preserve as a ponderosa pine savanna, but as was mentioned earlier, we have prolific pine regeneration. And so active forest management can also mean going in and clearing out those saplings as they come in. We also have used the tool of prescribed fire, which is an essential tool to restore fire into the system. Uh, this burn happened in 1999 uh, on Whitney Preserve. And unfortunately, in 2007, the Alaba fire hit right on the preserve and our neighbors. And unlike our Jasper fire, we did have significant loss. We lost 33 homes and one life in Alaba. Uh, this area that I mentioned earlier on the right side of the screen was completely burned up. Most of those homes were lost. But what we did see as well is that when that fire hit onto the preserve where that prescribed burn had previously occurred, it dropped out of a crown fire and it went back to more of that natural, cool fire. So it might seem counterintuitive, but putting fire on the landscape intentionally can be one of the most important tools for the health of our forest long term. The Nature Conservancy works with a variety of partners and agencies to explore how we can do that and improve the safety of our communities. And that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Carissa. Ben, give it to you to wrap things up. Thank you, Greg. Good morning. Let me first say thank you for all attending the uh, Governor's Egg Summit this morning and your interest in forest management and, and forest health issues here in the Black Hills. Um, as you can imagine, the, these topics of discussion consume quite a bit of our lives around here. It, it's a, a very valuable resource to, to everyone, both, both locally and, and uh, traveling here. Give you a little bit of idea of where I'm going to go this morning. I'm going to talk a little bit more about ecology of ponderosa pine. And you'll see some common themes emerging here. I'll talk a little more about mountain pine beetle and also wildfires. But I'll drill a little bit more down into the hows and whys of these and, and how the mountain pine beetle works. And then uh, also tie in with where forest industry fits in with this and forest products companies into the management and ecology of, of our Black Hills Ponderosa Pine systems. So we saw this picture with Carissa. I'll, I'll bring it up again. And much the same theme here, as Carissa said, the, uh, the photo on the left is from the Custer Expedition. The photo on the right was taken 
almost right at the height of when the mountain pine beetle epidemic was really getting rolling here in the Black Hills. And, and she talked about we've changed the processes here in the Black Hills. And, and that's, she's exactly right. When, when you look at the photo on the left, you, you see that, that there's just kind of clumps of trees. There's a, a lot of open hillsides. And it, well, you, you look at the photo on the right, and, and nearly everything wa was covered with, with trees at that time. And this is the Castle Ke Creek area. Um, Carissa pointed out the snag down in the front, but, but the other thing that I'll point out in, in this photo from 2000 is that th there's a bunch of trees that have just been cut down here, down in the, in the bottom there in the drainage. And, and they actually had to cut those trees down just so they could get the same view. It had grown in that much uh, over those 125 years. And, and this is indicative of what's happened across the Black Hills over the last 100 years. Uh, was it suppressing fires and um, changing some of the, the values on, on the landscape have resulted in forests that are outside of their healthy range of variation. We're, we're certainly not advocating for going back to the way it looked 125 years ago, 150 years ago, um, but we can do better, we can do better for this. We, we can do better for the health of the forest than the way it looked. So ponderosa pine, historically, is a disturbance-driven species. These forests have routinely experienced fires. We've heard that. Mountain pine beetles, an, an endemic uh, species here. Um, it, it's always been here. It's not an invasive. But, but the way that the forest has dealt with them in the past is very different than the way the forest deals with them now, naturally. And, and think back to the last slide on those photos, and, and you'll start thinking about how fires and, and the insects would have moved through the forest. So th it's always been a frequent disturbance regime here, but very low severity. We, we see wildfires burn through, but without taking out thousands of acres of trees and, and leaving you know, uh, landscapes void of, of forests. You see mountain pine beetles historically, but, but typically not to the extent that we've seen recently. Some, some uh, first settlers to the area and explorers uh, have used the term possible to ride a horse through at full gallop. And there's not a lot of places in the Black Hills now that you could ride a horse through at full gallop. And, and you've seen a lot of pictures here this morning of areas that, that have grown in too dense that sometimes it's even difficult to walk through. And, and the, the reason that this is important is, like Greg talked about clear cuts and, and nature's clear cuts that, that it puts in. And, talked about the silvicultural systems that we use in preference over clear cuts here in the Black Hills. And, and a lot of that is because of the seed source. And ponderosa pine has a very heavy seed. It doesn't disseminate very far from a seed tree. Uh, other forest types have seed cones that are designed to open up after fires, that are designed to be light and, and float on air and travel greater distances into opened up areas. But ponderosa pine seed does not do that. So. If you clear cut, or if you have a stand replacing fire or insect, insect epidemic, and you lose that seed source, that, that's a big issue around here. And that, that's the whole goal, is to prevent those types of disturbances from happening on the landscape here. So we'll segue a little bit into wildfires and mountain pine beetles. And, and we've heard a lot about that this morning, but, but these are really the two drivers of, of the disturbances here in the Black Hills. This is what we spend the bulk of our time as forest and how we work with these disturbances. We, we, we will never eradicate mountain pine beetles. I, I don't think we'd want to. And we'll always have a risk of wildfires. But, but the question is, what, what do you do ahead of these threats? What, what do you do to prepare for them? And importantly, it, it's a, you got to know a little bit about how they work. Now, this, this recent mountain pine beetle epidemic is not the first one that we've had. And in fact, we've had numerous mountain pine beetle epidemics. One of the largest was around the turn of the previous century, around 1900. And, and I'm going to have to read this just a little bit because I don't have it memorized yet. But this is Mr. Hopkins talking before the, the Committee of Agriculture back in, in Washington, D.C., in 1909. And he's talking about the mountain pine beetle epidemic and his observations in the Black Hills over the previous years. And, and he talks about, um, as an example of insect depredations that we have in the Black Hills of South Dakota, estimated by the Forest Service, a billion feet of, of timber destroyed by a beetle, which up to 1901 was an unknown species, but we have traced its work back more than 50 years. Between 1898 and 1906, this insect attacked and killed nearly 90% of the timber in the Black Hills National Forest. 
Now we've had some losses in some places from the mountain pine beetle recently, but, but nowhere to the extent that we've seen in the past and nowhere to the extent that nature could do on its own. And that, that's largely because of actions that we've taken to slow the epidemic and to make a difference on the landscape. It, incidentally enough, it, it's almost comical anymore. You, you go to forestry uh, conferences and such, and, and sometimes folks, well, are there trees in South Dakota? And um, th th much in the same sense here, th they're talking about the Black Hills of South Dakota, and uh, Mr. Hallery asks, what forest is that you refer to? <laughs> so uh, we're, we're kind of on the island out here, but uh, certainly not our first run with mountain pine beetles. And, and the way that they work, we've, we, Greg talked about it, Chris had talked about it, Mark talked about it, is, is just density-based. But we'll j get a little more in the details here on how the beetles actually work and, and why density matters, forest density matters. Um, generally speaking, the pine beetle will only affect larger trees, um, sometimes down to seven inches, but eight or nine inches and, ab and above is typically what they, what they affect and densely forested stands because of the, the way the pine beetles, they don't fly very well, they, they can't see, and so they don't really come out of a tree and figure out they're going to go to the next one over and they can see it and that looks like a good tree. They, they, they emerge out of the trees, they, they mill about, they, they find a tree, they land on it, and once they're into the tree, if they successfully get under the bark, they emit a pheromone. And that's how they find where they're going, is they smell. And if one beetle gets in and emits that pheromone, it tells all the other beetles, hey, this tree's weak, and this is where we all need to go. And, and it sends out a, a, a vacancy sign, basically, and that's where the beetles mass attack, and that's why you end up with all of those attacks on pine trees. Um, we, we talked about the, the epidemic itself recently, but, but the other thing that, that really stands out here is there's been some other reports from some states talking about the role of climate in this, and, and Dr. John Ball has done some recent research, and although he, he did say that, that the Black Hills generally have warmed up a, a degree or two, that the climate has always been just perfect for mountain pine beetles here. The mountain pine beetles have found a very nice home, and, and climate just doesn't play a role, and it all comes back to, to the density of the stands and forest management. The, the other major disturbance is fires, and this is a picture from the Jasper Fire. We've, we've heard a little bit about that here today. This was the largest fire in the Black Hills, and um, this is not what you want to see on the landscape. Again, we, we've talked a lot about why this is important in, in sense of both homes and resources, but also just in the sense of forest health. But wildfires are not always a problem. We've, uh, Chris and Mark talked about prescribed fires, but, but even wildfires aren't always a problem. And when they're not a problem, it's typically when they're burning through managed stands. As you can see, this stand has been thinned out, that the trees are well spaced. Uh, a fire burned through there, and it just scorched the bottoms of the trees a little bit. And, and this is very typical of what you see with fires burning through well-managed stands that have been thinned and spaced out. Um, fire is a natural process. Again, it, the question is not of, of if it's going to burn, but when. And then w once, once you kind of get over that hump and, and, and you've decided that it is going to burn, that the question then is what, what are you going to do about it proactively? It, it's not how many fire resources can you br come in, how, how many airplanes can you get to fly over and drop retardant, but what can we do ahead of that to actually help prepare the forest and prepare the communities for fire? And, and it comes back to, to management here. And uh, this is um, all, all part of reducing the fire hazard on the landscape. So the Jasper fire in, in, in 2000, um, th there was some great research that came out of that fire. And, and these are some, some photos from research in that, in that project area and in, in, in the fire footprint. And uh, much like the Custer photograph, we were, we're fortunate enough to have a, a snag out here in the middle th that we can watch the forest change over time. And so this is uh, just a few months after the fire went through on, on a stand that, as you can tell, was predominantly fairly dense. You can see all the stems in, in the background there. And, and this was a catastrophic stand replacing fire that this ran through. It consumed nearly all the biomass in this area, both trees and, and on the floor of the, f of the forest. You fast forward five years, and, and around here, we, we do have good precipitation. We have reasonable soils, and so the forest floor recovered fairly well. You see some, some uh, different plant species coming in there. You also see some of the trees starting to fall down. 
And, and that presents a lot of future concerns. And, and I always use the analogy of a campfire. When, when you put a log on the campfire, you can get cozy, roast some s'mores, have a good time. You, you back a dump truck up full, full of logs, and you're gonna have a hard time getting close enough with your marshmallow. And, and the same thing applies on the landscape. You have a couple logs here and there, not, not a big hazard out on the landscape, not a huge concern for fires. But when you have all of that fuel out there, it's a big concern for fire safety and for the future health of the forest. Fast forward to another five years after that last photo, and you can see most of the trees have fallen. The, the snag is still standing. They are quite persistent. Um, but what you don't see are any new pine trees. And, and that's what we've been talking about here today on the importance of managing these forests because when nature clear cuts it, as Greg said, you don't get the pine trees back. And there are areas within the Jasper Fire that will look like this for some time without a seed source. Other areas are regenerating nicely. As another example, this one's actually from Colorado. And um, you can this, this, this photo was taken uh, about two weeks apart from each other. And, and so on the top, you can see plenty of forest. On the bottom, after a fire has gone through, there's nearly no living trees. And then this is the photo of the same area actually taken this year. And same story in those areas, in those forests, you don't get the forests back in Ponderosa Pine systems. So here, here's where the rubber meets the road. And that's what, what do we do about this? And that, that's forest management. And forest industry plays a critical role in this as really the tool to get the management done. You can come up with ideas and prescriptions and projects to manage the forest all day long, but if you don't have the infrastructure to do that work, you're not going to get anything done on the landscape. You're not going to make a difference. These are some photos from during the last mountain pine beetle epidemic. Um, it, it's, photos are really worth a thousand words. I'll let them speak for each other, for, for, for each photo. But, but the areas that have been harvested through timber sales are green and the areas that were not are red and largely lost to mountain pine beetles. And, and you see this on the landscape. And, and that's, you know, some folks spend four or more years in college learning this. You guys are learning it in an hour. But <laughs> the forest management works. And all we have to do with ponderosa pine is thin the forest. It, it really isn't rocket science. We just need to make sure that we're doing enough of it on the landscape to make a difference. This is another photo, same story, an area that was thinned through a timber sale green, other areas are, are red. And this is what you typically end up with post-harvest. And we, this is a, just a perpetual cycle of going in and thinning the forest, and you come back every 20 or 25 years. So we saw pictures of mountain pine beetle. The same, same principles work for wildfire hazards. And this is from, from a Rapid City Journal talking about the North Pole fire uh, a couple years ago. And they talk about the, the area scorched by the North Pole fire previously was thinned by loggers who removed some of the fire's potential fuel and talked about the fire danger ratings being very high to extreme, but they were able to stop its advance after seven acres in 90 minutes because of the fuel reduction out there. And, and so forest products companies play, play an integral role, obviously as, as the tool to manage. And we have a long history of managing these forests through companies. Uh, Mark talked about Homestake Mine and the influence they had, talked about case number one, the very first federal timber sale. Um, it wasn't long after uh, Custer came through. We had the first sawmill in Rapid City in 1877. The first large mill was just after the turn of the century. And in 1915, the Rapid City Telephone Directory actually listed the mill job titles with, with the names because of the importance of the, of the industry playing on the economy here in Rapid City. In 1914, the Warren Lamb Sawmill was in Rapid City, down near where Founders Park is today. And this is a picture of, of, the, of the Warren Lamb Sawmill. For a time, they were actually sending logs down from the forest by water flume on, on Spring Creek, which is quite spectacular. There's still some remnants of this up there. Today, th things are a little bit lighter on the landscape, and, and modern equipment um, does not affect the, the other stands, does not affect the understory very much. It's light on the landscape, very light uh, track pressures. These are some examples of some equipment you might see today out managing the forest. And then the companies themselves, the mills, provide a lot of economic input back to the local communities. They provide about 1,400 jobs in direct employment, more than $120 million back locally. And for, for communities like Custer, Hill City, Spearfish, even Rapid City, th those, those are big deals. Those are big numbers for us. And, and for us in the Black Hills, timber plays a critical part of the ag picture here and, and, and the ag economy. Give you a little idea. Um, 
forest products are, are very forest products companies are very efficient with the use of the resource now, and none of a tree that gets cut and taken to a mill goes to waste. And so you start with a tree, and you can you harvest it, and that typically makes either posts and poles or boards, depending on the size of the tree. There's some residue that gets made into chips and planer shavings, and then those get made into pellets or sold as pine shavings for, for stables or, or other uses, and some of it even gets made into particle board here in Dakota Panel and Rapid City. All of a log that goes into a mill gets used anymore, and you don't have those waste piles out back. Uh, you don't have any waste of the resource anymore, and that, that's really important. Companies have done a lot to cross-integrate and to make sure that, that we're using as much of the resource as possible uh, while making as big of a difference as we can on the ground for forest health. I, I'm pretty fond of the Black Hills, and, and I know that, that everybody here in the area is, is equally fond. We place a lot of high values on the area, both recreationally, aesthetically, wildlife habitat, timber resources, water. But, but I think General Custer kind of said it the best when he was coming through. And this is from correspondence that he was sending back on his expedition coming through the Black Hills. And he said, no portion of the United States can boast of a richer or better pasturage, purer water, and of greater advantages generally to the farmer or stock raiser than are found in the Black Hills. Wood for fuel and lumber sufficient for all to come. And that, that's generally true. So long as we continue to manage our resource sustainably and, and to all work together across all the lands, uh, multiple land ownerships. And, and so with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Greg and uh, we'll take it from there. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. So I guess with that, we'll open it up to questions from the floor. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I do have another, another microphone here. I guess we've got a microphone in the back. Um, any questions? Uh, if not right off the bat, why I've got a, a couple of uh, teasers here that I'll start out with. Um, um, you have a question? Okay. I guess this would be probably directed towards Mark. Um, the popularity of ATVs and other recreational vehicles in the Black Hills, what do you see is the impact right now on our forests? Do you think um, it's becoming a little too popular, or what are the erosion factors and impact that you're seeing? Sure, <laughs> very good question, it's, and it's one that we're wrestling with right now. Um, it has become extremely popular, and there are places where there are problems that are starting to pop up, and I think it's a combination of things. One, um, it's education. We've got people that are out there that don't understand or realize that some of the things that they may be doing are causing problems. Um, and so we're trying to work on that by working with a variety of groups and our employees to, to get out and talk with people to provide education. Um, secondarily, we have some routes that were previous routes for um, temporary roads or other things that were designed for timber harvest level and we're finding that some of those maybe can't handle the volume of traffic that they're getting today. So we may need to either close some of those or in some cases we'll reroute them or reconstruct them so they're better able to handle the, the level of traffic. But it's, it's going to be an ongoing challenge and, and as, as the use grows, um, we're going to have to determine can we sustain an ever increasing number or is there going to have to be some kind of limits placed on it. Um, we do have, as I think most folks know, we have a permit system. Uh, folks buy a permit that they put on their vehicle, and we can use that money to help manage. Um, we hired a number of what we call trail rangers this year, and they're out on the trails. Uh, their primary purpose is to interact with people, provide education. In some cases where people are doing something that they should know is wrong, we're writing tickets. Um, and then we're also using those folks to identify where are those problem areas that we need to put some energy into either reconstructing, rerouting, or in some cases, closing. This question is for Mark as well. Uh, regarding invasive species, uh, Canadian thistle in particular, do you use biological control as a strictly a chemical control? I, I, to my knowledge, we haven't used, and, and I've only been here for two years, so it's possible we may have used some, but uh, predominantly what we use is chemical control. Um, and we work very closely with the counties um, so that we sort of try to pool our resources and, and focus on the areas of greatest need. But the reality is with 1.2 million acres, um, we're trying to do the best we can, but we're not going to catch every new infestation. We do a lot 
um, in our timber harvest areas or other areas where we uh, might create some new disturbed soils that could contribute to spread. Um, we also do a lot where we do uh, burning of our piles. We go back in and treat for weeds. Uh, but it's, it's a big challenge, and we're trying to do the best we can with the financial resources we have. Uh, unfortunately, there's not quite enough to do everything we'd like to. Uh, Eric Jennings from Spearfish. Uh, it, I think uh, Supervisor Van Edry talked about the fact that there's about 300,000 acres of private land in the Black Hills. Uh, some of these are larger tracts. Some of these are, are pretty small tracts in, at times. And uh, Mrs. Boosie talked about at land exchanges. So I'm curious, what is the process for doing those land exchanges? Because I would think that it would be better for the Forest Service to divest themselves of some of those small tracts that, that often would be cost more to manage than, than, to, than to, to trade. Yeah, it's, it's a, a definite challenge and we're glad that we have partners like Carissa and the Nature Conservancy to help us. Um, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, depends on your perspective, the process to do a land exchange is very time consuming and it's very costly. On the one hand, that's there to protect the public so we're not giving away the public's resource for nothing. Um, on the other hand, it does take a lot of time and a lot of energy. We wanna make sure that when we exchange out of land and acquire other lands that we're not giving away some really important resource uh, that should stay in public ownership. Uh, at the same time, we're not picking up somebody else's hazardous waste uh, on their property. So th there's a lot of steps that go into that and it's a pretty costly process. And our capacity um, to do those exchanges in terms of personnel is pretty limited. So we, we have to focus on the ones that we feel give us the greatest benefit um, out of that. Anytime we do a land exchange, if, if we approve that, I have to certify that it's in the public interest, that the public actually is better off as a result of that exchange than if we didn't do it. Um, so there's, there's a lot of steps and, and it literally has to go all the way up to a congressional committee for approval before we can actually complete the land exchange. So it's, it's, it, it's a definite um, positive thing in a lot of cases, but we're somewhat limited on how much we can do at a time. And, working with the Nature Conservancy and other groups gives us some added capacity that we wouldn't otherwise have. You wanna address that at all? I don't know if this is my place to say it, but I think part of the question too is on divesting of resources. And my understanding is that that is a sometimes even bigger challenge for the Forest Service is to just directly sell a parcel. And so in the example I gave of the Cane Creek Land Exchange, those families had wanted to acquire that land, those small inholdings for generations, but it just wasn't in the Forest Service capacity or permissions to sell the land directly. And so the exchange and working all together was a way to tackle a bunch of those all at once. Um, and it is extremely time intensive and takes a lot of resources and partnership to make it possible. And um, so expediting that would be awesome. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's a good reminder, Chris. So there is a, a parcel of land um, right next to our where our office is in Custer that um, we no longer need. It was a part of our administrative site, and we're in the process of selling that uh, parcel of land. It's about 100 acres. We joke it's the 100-acre wood. Um, and, and so that w is one area that we're looking at selling. Um, we also have a parcel of property that literally is part of the Custer Airport in Custer, and we're working with uh, Congress. Uh, they've introduced legislation to give us the authority to um, convey that property to the, to the county um, for that airport operation. So there are some limited opportunities. Unfortunately, the only tool generally I have in my toolbox that I'm authorized to do is a land exchange. Uh, in some cases, they do give us authority to do limited sale of property, but it's, it's generally a land exchange. Lynn Churchmore with Senator Thune's office. Um, as far as the forest thinning and the timber industry, and we've seen what impact that has on the jobs, what more can be done or how much thinning, more thinning do we need each year to maximize our industry and maximize the job potential? And then Carissa, I'd like your opinion on, as far as the thinning process from a TNC perspective, is that being done, uh, do you feel in the most efficient way or most protective way? Just some thoughts on that. I mean, the timber industry is really important in this area. And I will say the Black Hills is kind of a standard when 
speaking from Congress perspective, and Senator Bennett has referred to the Black Hills National Forest and how well it's been managed in some of the lar large landscape areas that have been able to be thinned. And so it's a job well done, but what more can be done to support the industry and to uh, keep our economy going here in the Black Hills? Thanks, Len. Um, so so forest, forest products companies in the Black Hills, uh, because of the land ownership, j just the acreages, uh, like Mark said, the, the biggest landowner here in the Black Hills is, is the U.S. Forest Service. And, and, and because of the land ownership percentages, the forest products companies typically rely on the, the Forest Service for about 80% of their logs coming into their facilities. Um, and, and because of that, to, to sustain the forest industry that we have here right now, uh, we, we tip, our, our typical ask is to have a, a sale program of about 220,000 CCF from the Black Hills National Forest of saw logs. Um, the, the Black Hills National Forest do, does a, a good job of managing the forest. Like Lynn said, it's, it's typically held up as a model. Um, it's, it's often number one or number two in the nation for their sale program, which, which says a lot about the Black Hills. It says a lot about some of the other forests and, and the state that they're in. Um, we, we are not at 220,000 CCF of saw timber. Um, and it, it's it, kind of a process right now as we come out of the mountain pine beetle epidemic to, to make sure that, that some of the numbers that, that we need to sustain forest industry are, are sustainable. That, that's, that's the whole idea here. The, the, the companies are multi-generational. They're not startups. They're not wanting to be here today and gone tomorrow. They're here looking to pass it down to their fourth and fifth generations, and th there's a lot of very active discussions to make sure that uh, what what the forest products companies need to stay to stay afloat is sustainable on the landscape. I would maybe advocate um, that that management is critical, as well as um, the tools that we were talking about of prescribed fire. So. Um, right now, I think we are doing a better job at management with timber and working together, but we're still very bar far behind on prescribed fire as a tool. Um, I, what do we burn an average year? Maybe under 3,000 acres in the forest. It's a you know, 1.5 million acre forest. <laughs> so we're way far behind. And that is not just important for... Um, for the diversity that it creates and the resilience that it helps the forest, but it's critical for how that resilience plays into the economies themselves long term as well. The healthier we can make the forest, the better it'll serve those same industries in the future and the health of our communities and prevent larger wildfires that are catastrophic for our communities. So having it on the ground, getting it implemented is a challenge. We, we understand that, but it's an essential challenge that we need to be looking further into and taking on if we're going to have it be a resilient forest long term. So the, as we've heard from, I think, everybody this morning, um, we have a changed landscape out in the Black Hills National Forest from what we had 15, 20 years ago. Um, we're trying to get a really good handle right now on exactly what that looks like. Uh, and we've started last summer, and this summer is the second year of an accelerated survey to do uh, get a, a snapshot in time of what the effects of the mountain pine beetle epidemic were across the forest as a whole, as well as some of the large wildfires um, that we've had over that 20-year period as well. Um, as we get that information together, the next step is to be uh, to have a collective dialogue with the people involved to determine what is a sustainable level going forward and can sustain that multi-generational, ongoing timber industry. Timber industry is key for us to be able to manage the forest because, as I mentioned earlier, when we have to pay somebody to do that work and we don't get any value back, um, the cost gets cost prohibitive. Um, so continuing to have a healthy timber industry that can help us achieve our management objectives and the outcomes that we want is really important. The other thing is we discussed the pre-commercial nature of the smaller trees. There's not currently a market or at least a sizable market for those trees. If we could find a way to utilize those younger trees through a biomass operation, a biodiesel operation, somebody who'd be willing to pay us for that rather than us paying them to cut it down and, and dispose of it, 
uh, would allow us to do a lot more acres. Um, we estimate we should be trying to thin pre-commercially 40,000 acres a year. Um, we're lucky if we can do 15,000 in a year. So we're falling behind in terms of that piece of, of work. And, and we have lots of discussions with industry and others about what's the solution. Um, and and, and I don't, if somebody out there's got the silver bullet, I'd like to hear it because we're still trying to find it. Um, but we are looking for, for avenues to address that. Okay, thank you. I think we're about out of time, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, Mark, Carissa, and Ben. We appreciate your being here today and sharing your wealth of knowledge with, uh, with our audience. And uh, with that, we'll turn it back over to, uh, to Maggie. Sounds good. Um, thank you again. Let's give them a round of applause.